Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Celia Parker Fetterman. I'm a senior at Shortridge, and today for World Changing 101, we are joined by uh, Kit Malone. Kit Malone works with the ACLU of Indiana and um, organizes uh, public outreach programs uh, to identify transgender advocates and engage them with uh, engage the communities on the importance of uh, education and knowing their rights. Hi, Kit. We're really happy to have you here. Absolutely thrilled to be here, Celia. Thank you. Thanks for that. It's always bizarre to hear your um, your own intro. Like whenever someone introduces you and says what your job is, it's one of the most bizarre things in the world. Yeah, we're really happy to have you here. I know um, people have been wanting, you know, more um, LGBTQ and trans rights centered conversations, and that's what pretty much what we're going to be doing today. So I'm happy about that. All right, um, to get started, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how did you first become involved with the ACLU? Absolutely. So um, I just a little bit about me. I um, what I do with the ACLU specifically is run our LGBTQ rights project, which is sort of a statewide project um, to uh, fight um against sort of the the constant onslaught of attack bills that we see every year in our legislature um, attacking the rights of lgbtq people and also to organize and support the community in indiana and i got here um it's a very long story but i used to be a school teacher um i, I taught um uh, at both junior high and high school levels for over 20 years uh, and then ended up through a bunch of weird life circumstances working instead on a campaign to add civil rights protections to Indiana states for LGBTQ people. And that was my very first campaign work and I liked it so much that I eventually ended up moving over to the ACLU to do it full time. Um, and you know, my work includes lobbying, um, working with lawmakers to craft legislation or to fight legislation. And the most fulfilling part is, of course, working with the community and providing them specifically with tools, like bringing the fire from the mountain and saying, like, this is how you do it. Um, let's get together and organize and uh, make some of these arch conservatives lives super hard. Yeah, definitely. That's like, yeah, I'm um, sure that it was an interesting, you know, career change from being a teacher to doing this, but it sounds like you really, really like love doing it. Um, you kind of touched on this, but uh, can you elaborate a little more on what the ACLU does in Indiana? Oh yeah, absolutely. So the American Civil Liberties Union, um, the short like elevator pitch version of what we do is we sue the government when the government violates people's civil rights. Um, I love to say that, um, and it is true. Uh, essentially, our job is as a legal firm, we're a, we're, we're a nonprofit legal firm, is to find clients whose, whose, whose rights have been violated by the government or by a government entity. Um, that could be um, a local government, it could be a, a the, you know, police force, it could be a school, it could be just anything that is primarily funded or an institution of the government, um, which, and of course, civil rights violations happen all the times in a number of different arenas, and, and we're there for all of it. Um, we're constitution defenders, primarily on the First Amendment, but really anything, we have a very broad and expansive idea of what civil rights are and who they should apply to. And uh, so we work on basically every topic. My workday will touch on immigration law. My workday will, will, will touch on, um, you know, violations of human rights in our prison systems and LGBTQ discrimination, housing and homelessness, and uh, just criminal justice and just the entire gamut of uh, civil rights uh, concepts. And it's, 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 it's a really cool job because I do get to see such a such a wide slice of subjects that I'm really passionate about in the first place. But then also it can be a really hard and stressful job uh, because it does, uh, especially in the previous four years where it just sort of felt like you're just marching, you know, upstream and getting knocked back 20 meters for every few meters you swim. And so like watching it 
I don't know what the next four years are going to be like, but I will tell you that that tax of having to fight um, real violations of, uh, uh, of the Constitution and real violations of folk civil rights um, in, in the way that we had to, like seeing that hopefully come to a close is, is looking forward to actually being able to make some progress. Yeah, I feel I feel optimistic about it too. Like nobody really knows what's going to happen, but uh, do you think it's going to be a, at least a little bit easier in these next four years to try to get uh, your message across um, with whatever you're working with? Yeah, it, it, I, I think it's I think it's a both and, you know, you you get used to in this business of thinking of things as a both and. There's no such thing as a, like a clear win or a clear loss. Um, one of the downsides of a friendlier administration is that your issue can seem um, like it gets lost in the clutter. Um, once people feel like they've done the thing, they've gotten, you know, a different administration and they've changed it over and now all the good things are going to happen. There is a tendency sometimes for folks to lose the urgency um, that is required to make change because we know that we know all of us know that that that, that uh, making a more equitable world has uh, has has a lot more to do with your everyday than it does just the president and who is president. But unfortunately, who is president can take up a lot of the space. Um, it's easy for people to get mad about things like systemic racism um, in our in our prison system, for instance. Uh, when we have a figurehead, yes, particularly for what, for I think many white people, um, self included, you know, we have that person we can we can just easily see and hate there up there. When we have to deal with where 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 we're all sort of complicit in these issues. Um, when we have a friendlier administration, that stuff can get lost, and I think that can be true for 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 the LGBTQ issues that I work on too. Yeah, I totally agree with that. There, um, I'm gonna ask a question, and then um, I'm gonna take one of the questions that somebody asked to kind of combine them. Um, it was, "What do you do with the ACLU, and what is your favorite part about what you do?" Okay, so. I direct our LGBTQ rights project, and that's an all fronts um, equality project uh, that we run out of the ACLU of Indiana. My job is to lobby lawmakers. My job is to organize events that support our community. My job is to identify trans leaders at the grassroots level, the grassroots being, you know, folks on the ground level um, doing it because it's the right thing to do and find ways to give them more power, to organize them, to connect them to one another, and also to provide them with training on how to do things that advocacy professionals have access to, but maybe they don't have access to. Things like how to interact with media, things like how to read, you know, a piece of legislation, um, support from our lawyers when they need that kind of support. And, I, you know, it's really rewarding because what you're really doing is looking at people, asking them, you know, what do you need? And then how can I take this massive nationwide organization that I happen to work for and bring those tools to you so that you can use them in Gas City, Indiana, or wherever it is you happen to live? Yeah, I think I think what you do is just amazing. I think that's just that's really important, especially in Indiana. Um, and we were kind of talking about this before, just Sometimes, you know, we do forget that Indiana is a very conservative state um, and it's really important to have this support network um, when you need it and that you know that you have it, especially because, you know, we're in Indiana and yeah. Um, yep. So you've been talking about lobbying. Uh, can you explain what lobbying is? And um, you kind of talked about it playing a role uh, in the your work with the ACLU, but can you kind of elaborate on that? So lobbying is the process of, well, let's start with the word lobbying. It contains the word lobby, and that is literally what you are doing. It literally goes back to like hanging out in the lobby outside of the Senate or chambers or the House chambers in our Indiana State House and waiting for a lawmaker to have time to talk to you. You can have pages send notes to them, say, hey, Kim Malone from the ACLU is out here who wants and wants you know ten minutes to talk to you about this trans health bill or something like that, um, and uh, 
it's actually how a lot of interactions with lawmakers happen. Um, a lot of lobbyists like me, our primarily primary job is to connect ordinary Hoosiers to their lawmakers. Um, so I spend a lot of time finding ways to connect um, uh, trans folk who live in Indiana, for instance, um, to their lawmakers when we have bad legislation, as we do every year um, moving through. We want to make sure that our lawmakers hear and see the people that are going to be affected. Uh, we have a 100% kill rate on um, anti-trans bills in Indiana since I started doing this work. We haven't made let one pass, um, unlike a lot of other states. And uh, a lot of that is due to the fact that we have carefully cultivated relationships with a lot of the Republicans, frankly, because we live in Indiana and we have a Republican super duper majority in our legislature. So there's no getting any work done without being palsies with some of these guys. Um, so, but we do find that when we bring folks from their districts in to sit down and talk to them, um, that they actually become, if not allies, because I don't want to go so far, because they're not allies, but they will become people who may quietly choose not to hear a bill, uh, may, may see something that's really bad and say, you know what? I know Kit's out there and she's going to bug me with a thousand phone calls from anger constituents if this happens. So maybe we just won't, maybe we just won't open this can of worms this year. And that's worked for us really well. And that's, I don't know if that answers the questions. That's sort of like the bird's eye view of what lobbying is. Oh yeah, that, that helps a lot. Um, and um, I've actually worked with Kit in the past. Um, I'm a part of a community organization called Teen Council and every day, uh, not every day, every year, um, except this year because of COVID, we uh participate in youth advocacy day where we set up meetings with our legislators and we go and lobby and try to get one-on-one -on -one meetings with them um and it's definitely it's it's interesting to see how it works um and it's really um you feel like not really that you're really changing anything but that you're getting your voice out there and because you're sometimes you get to directly talk to somebody that represents your district um uh, can you talk kind of about what are trans rights like right now in Indiana? And um, are there any bills currently in the state house that are threatening LGBTQ uh, or trans rights? Um, so right now, um, we had like actually a weirdly great last year. Um, despite sort of assaults from our executive branch, um, we got a great Supreme Court victory that basically affirms that the civil rights laws of our of our country apply to trans people as well and that's a kind of kind of amazing it's, it's it's a change really in the structure of civil rights laws so in indiana um you know we like to say that you know we are trans people are protected um but we're not explicitly protected in state in a state code that protects a lot of other groups so it's very murky um, that confusion does lead to a large amount of discrimination. Um, you know, we're hoping that um, people come to see our our understanding of the law. You know, we were able to sue Evansville schools um, on behalf of a trans boy um, who was being discriminated against, uh, in his case, denied access to appropriate facilities. Um, we won. The, the federal courts agreed with our interpretation of the law that the civil rights codes uh, apply to him. But on the ground, you know, that sounds really, really great for anyone who can get an ACLU lawyer. Um, and uh, but of course, the the practical um, on the ground, if you're a trans person, you are experiencing discrimination. I would say that 100 percent of trans people, particularly students in school, have experienced some kind of discrimination. Um, schools are in Indiana are often very poorly equipped um, to understand what is happening with trans people and to um, to support them, to affirm them, to provide them equal access to school activities and school facilities, um, which is funny because we noticed that the, it is often not the student body that is the, 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 the source of the problem. The source of the problem is the adults at the school um, who are very concerned in ways that their own, um, in, in ways that their own their own children often don't share. <laughs> so um, yeah, as always, kids are a little bit, usually a bit ahead of the bar on this stuff. 
Yeah, that, it's really great work um, that you guys do in the state. And that's that's really good that you guys were able to, you know, take that up to the federal level and get that uh, boy his protections. Um, so there's some questions um, in the Q&A. One of the questions is, um, so you are trans, um, but how did it feel when you came out? Um, if you felt scared or overwhelmed, how did you handle uh, those feelings? Uh, pretty poorly, straight, like just straight up, like I was scared and overwhelmed. Um, and, um, you know, I was out in a particularly violent way and um, that affected a lot of my life. Um, I lost a job as a teacher um, because a stalker um, learned that I was was trans and reported me to a school board in, an, in a conservative and unfriendly county. Um, I was homeless for a little while and actually that's how I ended up doing activism and advocacy work is that I know, you know, I was I was able to sort of claw my way into an activism um, campaign simply because I was bored and living out of a truck. <laughs> and now I do this for a living, which is something I never would have predicted in my entire life. Um, but I will say that as I grew um, and as I as I found a center of stability, um, one thing that brought me back into the world and that um, reconnected to me to the things that are important to me uh, was, was community and the uh, you know the community of trans and queer people of all kinds that I found myself in living in and living with um, really kept me alive through that time and I think that's very true for trans people generally is that we tend to organize our own families and we tend to connect with one another um, in when it's difficult for us to find that connection with other people um, because we just have so much shared experience. Thank you for sharing that. Um, there's some other questions in the chat. Uh, what is the worst part of your job? Um, well, yeah, th there's no easy way to say it. Um, it's not what you would think. People are like, you must hate going and talking to those conservatives. Honestly, I kind of like kicking butt and going in and like talking to these people and weirding them out and making them mad and like telling them the hard thing. I kind of dig that. That's the thing that I like every day. But I do work also broadly because our advocacy team is a team of three people. We're small but mighty. Um, and uh, since I'm since we all work together on every one of our core issues from racial justice to to LGBTQ rights to prison um, prison reduction, incarceration reduction, voting rights and free speech. Um, we share a lot. And uh, one of the things that I, it's, I don't wanna say I hate doing it, but it is one of the most painful things about the job is reading our intake. Um, we get about 600 requests for help every month for a legal team of currently two lawyers because our, our third lawyer is on leave, pregnancy leave right now. Um, and those, the complaints that we get are heartbreaking. Um, and knowing that we'll only be able to take a few of them um, because we have to prioritize with that caseload. Um, the, the things in particular, the letters that we get from prisoners um, are um, shocking. And uh, they, there's such a pattern to them that you see like really you get a picture of what the life particularly you know we've sued on behalf of a few trans uh incarcerated mm -hmm. trans people and um the conditions they're kept under um forced isolation um su multiple suicide attempts it's uh it's heartbreaking and uh but also return regrounds you in the work and you know you read those stories and you're like this is why i do this yeah, that would be a I I couldn't imagine like reading all through all those requests because you can't take all of them because you have such a small team. Um, do you find that a lot of people you work with uh, through the ACLU have been misinformed about topics like healthy relationships, um, LGBTQ and trans rights? And how do you go about 
educating people if you find that? Well, I think that um, there's a, yes. I mean, yes, obviously the, sh the short answer to that is yes. And it of course is in, in, one, in one way or another my job to, to educate people. But I wanna complicate the answer a bit. I don't think